Now I've got to stand up, change, and do the maths. Ugh. Math time. Uh, 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 uh. Speed is distance over time, yes. But as a sprinter, the distance is set by the event. We're not competing in the equivalent of the land speed record. There's no flying 10 to 30 Olympic events. So now you're looking at the speed you go times the time that it takes. The faster you go, the less time it takes. They're inversely proportional, but in a good way. That's the closest you're going to get to moral maths. So as all you're trying to do is go faster, is there a sprint equation? Yes. Your speed is your stride length times your stride frequency in meters per second, which you then convert to kilometers per hour. Right, let's investigate the stride length. When you're walking, your stride length is the distance between your back foot and your front foot. But sprinting is effectively hopping from foot to foot. There's air time. So it's the distance from where your back foot takes off to where your front foot lands back down on the ground again. Stride frequency is how many times you can make that happen in a second. But again, these two are inversely proportional. But in a bad way. What you give to one, you take from the other. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. If you invest all your effort in stride length, like trying to cover the most distance with each stride, you're going to spend a lot of time in the air. Air time, baby! Like when I'm doing bounding! And the big law of sprinting is, you can only propel forward when your foot's actually in contact with the ground. Once you're airborne, you can't affect your force going forward. You've got to wait for another opportunity to touch back down to push off again. Actually, wait is probably not the right word. You've got to do a whole bunch of things to optimize your position before your foot touches back down again. Fine, so I hit stride frequency. Quicker I'm back on earth, the more I can keep moving forward. Fossey, fossey, fossey! It's a good plan. The problem is, there's a limit to the number of revolutions you can do in a second. Maybe six. It's energy draining, inefficient, and neurally challenging. So as with most things, you're looking for a balance between the two. My favourite word's about to come up. Stride length and stride frequency both exist on a spectrum. You're trying to find the graphic equalising perfect balance between the two for you. The last basic is body angle. Remember when I said you can only propel when your foot's in contact with the ground? Yeah, well there's a part two to that. Your propulsion angle is directly determined by the vector of the force. I literally made that sentence up. Basically, you go in the opposite direction to the direction of the force against the floor. Yeah, I know, the angle you hit, that's the angle you go. You hit it from above, you go up. You hit it from 45, you go 45. You goose step in, you're going forward. Come on, where's the sprint stuff? But remember, the body's a complex structure of bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments. You then have individual joint ranges and differing optimal ranges of contraction. Basically, your angle of push is determined by your individual biomechanics. But there are some general guidelines. Our anatomy means that our hip flexing, hip extending ability wins from static and leans towards stride frequency. But our hip extending, hip hyperextending power becomes more relevant with momentum, which leans towards stride length. We lean forward to accelerate rather than standing upright and pulling back and behind us because we can generate a lot more force from hip flexion to hip extension. Just so long as you keep a straight line to stop dissipation of forces. But once we've hit our maximum speed turnover or cadence, rather than just redlining it in third, we need to change gear. So now we can reduce the lean, and if we have good hip hyperextension, if we have good hip hyperextension, we can rely on that to add a little nos boost and maintain it. I keep banging on about this hip hyperextension and did a video on it, because in a more upright position, it's the same vector rules. To keep you going forward, you need to push down from behind you to keep you going up and forward. There's probably some math term for it, but who cares? If you do it, you feel like you're flying. Now, the acceleration movement is similar to a squat, but you know what it looks even more like? The step up. And the top speed portion looks suspiciously like a lunge or pulling a sled. But slow your roll before you leg it to the gym and start smashing out those exercises. Here's the difference. These types of weights exercises increase the force that you can put through the floor. But this force takes a long time. The movement is slow. 
It's measured in seconds. Tempo is counted in Mississippi's. In sprinting, the ground contact time is like 180 milliseconds. That's the m of a Mississippi. So in the next video, I'm going to go into the angel and devil that is weight training in sprinting. Because this is one area where tailoring the suit to you individually can make or break your sprint training. It's not the most important, but it's the area that can improve your performance quite a lot if you get it right, but can completely corrupt your sprint training if you get it wrong. Hmm? Sounds ominous. Hi, he's into lunch! If this has helped demystify sprinting at all, let me know in the comment section below. Otherwise, hit the thumbs up, and if you like my vibe, please subscribe. Oh, 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 oh,